This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, Energy Leadership Lecture. Uh, my name is Chris van der Waal. I'm a professor in the materials department here at uh, UCSB. And it's a uh, distinct pleasure to welcome Arun Majumdar today. Um, I'll uh, first say a, a few words about the um, Institute for Energy Efficiency, which is uh, sponsoring this lecture. Uh, the Institute is an interdisciplinary institute uh, which is dedicated to the development of cutting-edge science and technologies. It supports an efficient and sustainable energy future, uh, relying on the expertise of our acclaimed UCSB uh, faculty, uh, as well as scientists and engineers from uh, various disciplines. By fostering these collaborations and sponsoring research, uh, as well as expediting commercialization of new technologies, the uh, mission of the Institute is a key driver for significant advances in energy efficiency. And one of the things the uh, Institute does is to invite leaders in the field to tell us about their vision of energy and future of energy. And that's why we are particularly uh, pleased to have Dr. Arun Majumdar with us today, uh, Vice President for Energy at Google. Dr. Majumdar received his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering at the Institute of Technology, Bombay, and his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, uh, in 1989. Uh, Arun was actually a professor here at UCSB in the Department of Mechanical Engineering between 1992 and 1996. Uh, at that point, he moved to the University of California at Berkeley uh, to the Department of uh, Mechanical Engineering as well as Material Science and Engineering uh, as a chaired professor. And he also was uh, associate laboratory director at uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, Director for Energy and Environment. In 2009, Dr. Majumdar was nominated by President Obama to become the founding director of uh, the Advanced Research uh, Projects Agency for Energy, so-called ARPA-E. Uh, and he served in that position until uh, 2012. And for the last uh, two years of, of that appointment, uh, he also served as the acting undersecretary of energy, as well as a senior advisor to the secretary of energy. Um, and at that point, he uh, joined uh, Google uh, as vice president for energy. Uh, Dr. Majumdar has a number of uh, honors. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And of course, those honors are based on uh, major research accomplishments uh, during his uh, career, when he worked on nanoscale materials and devices, uh, as well as large engineered systems. Uh, a lot of that research over the years has been associated with energy, which of course puts him in an excellent position for his uh, current uh, uh, position at Google, uh, where he uh, clearly has a distinct influence on energy and its future. And he will tell us about his vision uh, for uh, energy in his presentation, which is entitled Energy and the Industrial Revolution, past, present, and future. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Arun Majumdar. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind and warm introduction. 
you know, I just introduced myself as a recovering government bureaucrat nowadays, but uh, I'm happy to hear that introduction. Can you hear me at the back? Great. All right, so um, what I'll do is I'll not go too deep into any particular subject, but I'd like to give you sort of the context of energy, or at least the way I perceive it, and um, where we have come from, um, and frankly, where we are going, where we ought to be going. So what I'd like you to do is to step back for a moment and go back in history, to the history when the United States was being created, 1770s, 1776. These were the times of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and very interesting times. And if you think back as to what it was, the only memory that we have are in pictures. So let me show you a few pictures. George Washington, you know, fighting the Revolutionary War on his horse. And then, you know, uh, for lighting at night, people used to use these lamps which used whale oil, whale blubber for lighting. That was the state of the art. And of course, we, those have become obsolete. And that, was what, uh, uh, that also coincided with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, James Watt, the engine. And then after that, what followed was an amazing period in human history. From the scientific point of view, the mechanization, the engines, led to the laws of thermodynamics that we all use today. But that did not exist when the engine was being created. It came later. And modern physics came out of that. And so if you look back at that time, the last 250 years, which is a little blip in human history, it has been the most remarkable period in human history because from that, this is where we are now. You go to the grocery store with about 300 horses pulling you in your car, and you go across the continent with 100,000 horses in a plane that pull you in a few hours, in a four or five hours, which used to take months before. And that, that last 250 years is when this has happened, and it's absolutely spectacular. And that's not the, in the last 100 years or so, this is what happened the grid, and it goes back to Tesla and Edison. And when they were fighting it out, whether it's the AC or DC, regardless, we got the grid, and there's no going back. In fact, if you don't have electricity for a, in a few minutes or a few hours, the whole life stops. And so this is where we are today. And as I said, this last 250 years has led to immense amount of prosperity at least the way we count it is GDP per capita. If, if you use that as a measure of prosperity, it's been an exponential growth. And if you look at the origins of this industrial revolution, it's all about energy. Because without energy, you cannot have mechanization. You cannot have the electricity. And it's all how we source, how we distribute, how we use energy. That's the last 250 years. That's the history. And it's all been about fossil energy. What else has changed exponentially over the last 250 years? Well, population. This is a much longer time scale out here. You know, this is in BC, 7,000, 6,000 BC. But over the last few hundred years, the population went from 700 million people in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to 7 billion people. And this population is going to grow. It's going to grow to about roughly 10 billion people by the end of the century. And that's mostly in developing economies, not even out here. And there the economies are growing. So the question is, if the industrial revolution so far has been about energy and mostly fossil energy, do we have enough fossil energy to support both the population growth that's going to happen and the exponential economic growth that we all want to happen. Do we have enough energy? And in fact, fossil energy. 
And the answer is absolutely yes. These are the reserves of global oil reserves. And as you can see, there is no peak oil. Why? Because the technology for discovery and extraction is not only keeping pace, is actually more advanced and is improving day by day. So you can extract oil from deeper and deeper oceans, and there's a lot of it out there. And the one on the right-hand side is about gas, natural gas, around the world, and this does not even count the U.S. shale gas. And by the way, U.S. does not have the largest reserves of shale gas. It's China. So that's where we have a lot of fossil fuels still around. So the question is, if you are to move forward, and if you are to remain in this world of fossil-based industrial revolution, we have to keep in mind a few other things. Number one is the fact that if you are dependent on this fossil fuel, there's an economic impact. The top graph is the price of oil, which is a global market, price of oil over the years, the history of that. And you can see some large fluctuations, which is really bad for business. Because if you have fluctuations, you can't predict what your costs are going to be. If you have a company like FedEx, which depends on transportation, their costs will fluctuate as well. And these fluctuations have nothing to do with what happens in the United States. It's mostly governed by events that are international. So it's really not under our control. The bottom one is a balance of payment. That means if, you, if we are importing oil, we have to pay someone. And that number is actually going down. We are importing less oil than what we used to in the past. And people are getting happier about that. But that number is still a large number. It's about $300 billion, almost a billion dollars a day. That's the balance of payment. And so if you are to continue this fossil-based industrial revolution, we've got to keep this in mind. This is the world that we'll be living in. And frankly, right now, we are not the only one. This is China. Domestic consumption going in a different direction than domestic production. And so we are not the only ones. The other developed nations, besides the United States, uh, Germany, England, we are all in the same boat. And everyone's trying to figure this out. How do you actually get out of the stranglehold of a single source of energy for transportation as well as for electricity generation? So this is on the economic side. There's obviously an environmental side. And as we know, uh, and this in the academic community, in, the, in most of the scientific community, it's a well-settled matter that there is global warming and it is by human beings. You can have isotopic evidence to show that. And so far, we know that the average temperature rise has been 0.8 degrees. From the, so that's the average from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Global, the world has warmed by 0.8 degrees, and we're getting scared about 2 degrees. That's the Copenhagen Agreement, that we are not going to exceed 2 degrees. Well, we're not sure whether we can maintain that. But that's the average. As we all know, these are not predictable averages. There's a distribution around the average, and people seem to forget the distribution. So I'm going to show you the distribution of the temperatures, the deviation from that average, which will follow a Gaussian distribution. Since so sometimes in the world, let's say we are in Santa Barbara, some summers are a little hotter than average, some summers are colder. So we go around the world and see where is, the, where is it colder than the average, where is it hotter than the average, and look at the frequency of where that goes on around the world. If you do that, you're going to get a bell curve. And you'll see, I'll just show it to you. The first is the theory, it's very smooth, and then you'll see data, and that distribution is going to move. And so here we go. This is the theory. And this is the data, 1950s and 60s. So you can fluctuating. The red is the hotter than average. Blue is the colder than average. And see where this is going. So what you find is something quite intriguing. 
the average has certainly moved. And by the way, this is, I'm taking only the summer temperatures, but this has huge impact on the grid, for example. So this is, the average has certainly moved. The whole distribution has moved. It has broadened. And the tails of the distribution are reaching four and five sigma at probabilities that are unheard of. And it ain't going the other way. So, and this, the tail of the distribution has a disproportionate effect on our lives, whether it's livestock, agriculture, you think about it. And that is a disproportionate effect. It's not a linear effect. And that is really worrisome. And so, and but if you look at the geographical distribution, which I have not presented and will not present, I'll just tell you, the geographical distribution is such that there are hot spots. And in 2012, there's a massive hot spot in the Midwest, United States. People compare it to the Dust Bowl. Well, a few years before that, it was in Moscow. A few years before that, it's somewhere else. So this hot spot is like a bubble in a carpet. You try to press it down, it comes, shows up somewhere else. And we don't know where it's gonna show up because we do not understand climate change. We understand global warming because that's just thermodynamics, first law. You got more energy coming in than going out, the temperature has to go up. But we don't understand where things are gonna happen in the world because if we could, we could predict all these things. That's the world we're gonna live in. So if you ask the question, since we're talking about the history, it's fair enough to ask the question, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, how much CO2 have we emitted? Because the lifetime of CO2 molecules in the atmosphere is in 100 years, a couple of 100 years. So almost all of them are still there. Some of them are getting have gotten absorbed in the oceans, in acidifying. So how much CO2 have we emitted in this large capacitor that we call the atmosphere? If you do the numbers, and I'll give you rough numbers, if you do the numbers, it's about a trillion tons since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Then you ask the question, if you know how much reserves of fossil fuel we have, whether it's oil, coal, natural gas, based on the known reserves, which seem to keep increasing over time because the technology improves, but today's known reserve, if you take all this fossil fuel and just burn it, burn all the fossil fuel, how much more CO2 can we emit? So here's the question. How much more CO2 can we emit based on known fossil fuels today? And that number is about three trillion tons. So three times more than the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and the whole Industrial Revolution. Then you ask the question. The one trillion tons in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution took about 240 years, 250 years. This three trillion tons of fossil fuel, how long do you think we will take to burn all that, given our dependence on fossil fuels and the rate of economic growth if we keep using that? How long do you think it'll take? And the answer comes back about 75 to 100 years. So three times more in approximately one third the time, that's almost a 10x factor. Then you ask the question, there's all this fossil fuels, the carbon, carbon bonds that are there in the ground, how much are they worth? And the number is about tens of trillions of dollars. So here's the dilemma, here's the option or choice that society is often asked to make. Should we keep those dollars, the 10 trillion dollars in the ground and not use it for economic growth because we want to save the environment? Or should we use those $10 trillion for this exponential growth around the world and screw the environment? That's the, uh, that's the choice that society is asked to make. And my friends, that's just a false choice. And the best way to answer that question is this quote by the former oil minister of Saudi Arabia, the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. It's because we transitioned to better solution. And that, those better solution is what happens in university through research in science and engineering. And so my former boss, Steve Chu and I, wrote a paper that appeared in Nature while I was transitioning out. And we called for a new industrial revolution. If the first industrial revolution is all about fossil-based energy, well, surely 
if the next industrial revolution does not happen, we're going to burn ourselves in some way. So we need a new way of thinking about it. And think about what happened in the last 250 years. The engine, the first and second laws of thermodynamics, all that was created during that. And that's the kind of research, long-term research, that we need for this new industrial revolution. New science has to happen. New engineering has to happen. New businesses have to happen. Which is what the purpose of ARPA-E was created for. I mean, that, that's the reason it was created, for those breakthroughs in science and engineering that would lead to technological innovations that would lay the foundation of entirely new businesses that do not exist today. That was the purpose of ARPA-E. So if I were to show what the purpose was, let me show it through something that ec economists call learning curves. The learning curve is as follows. If you take a technology, in this case, horse carriage, over time and over scale, if you make many of them, the cost comes down and the performance improves. So every technology, whether it's, it's you know, Moore's law or some other law, you'll follow this curve, and you can fit an exponent through it. On a log log curve, you know, pretty much things look like straight lines. So you can fit exponents through it. And economies all worry about what that exponent really means. But essentially, you, this is what happens. And you can do incremental research. You can make the wheels of this, you know, of, of the horse carriage better, lower friction. You can get bigger horses, but it's still a horse carriage at the end of the day. The role of ARPA-E was not to improve the horse carriage. The role of ARPA-E was to create new learning curves for transportation, in this case. Where you start off something that may be expensive, but it's a different paradigm. You start off by saying that, okay, we'll start, we'll start with a whole portfolio, multiple shots at goal, and some of them are gonna fail in the future, but we don't know which ones. But there is a chance that some of them are gonna continue, and here these all seem very transformative, but one of them eventually is gonna be disruptive because it's just cheaper and better and cleaner. That was the whole idea. So that the country as a whole, the United States as a whole, gets the benefit not only of the insurance policy of this yellow curve, but a disruptive innovation that happens and transitions to the blue curve before other nations do. That was the idea of creating new learning curves. And to do so, with to enhance the US economic, energy, and environmental security as well as the technological lead for the United States. That was the purpose of RPE. So I'm gonna show you a few examples of the shots at goal. Clearly, I cannot go through all 400 projects that we funded, but I'll give you a few examples and, and talk about some of the challenges that we face in creating these uh, shots at goal. So when you talk about energy, we have to talk about energy systems. And there are two systems in this country. One is the stationary system, which is electricity in your home, it's power generated in a power plant, comes through a transmission distribution network to your homes, or you have natural gas coming to lines. These are stationary systems. The other is a transportation system, which is mostly, predominantly, about gasoline and, and diesel and the use of light duty and heavy duty vehicles that, for transportation. And these two systems are largely independent, except for the fact that we have a few electric vehicles now, but that's a very, very small percentage. So if you look at what has happened in the energy business, there are a few game changes that have happened that actually started in the 1980s. The obvious one is horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing of shale gas to extract those hydrocarbons. This, by the way, was thought as a wild idea in the 80s and 90s, but people kept at it, and this has become a disruptive innovation. How does it work? Well, I think some of you know this. Uh, you, have, you go down about a mile or more, and there's a shale layer out here, which is a very highly impermeable rock, but there's a lot of hydrocarbons uh, embedded in it, and you, you, you fracture it with very high water pressure, and increase the permeability and the natural gas, and actually you know, not just methane, but long-chain hydrocarbons also come out. Now, this has been an amazing 
revolution that has happened in the United States, but there's some good science and engineering that still needs to be done. Let me explain this. If you look at the production of single wells, this is the production volume, the volumetric flow rate over time. You see this, initially these wells go up and then they go down, they go up and they go down, and this peak keeps increasing over time. That means we are getting better and better. However, what no one can explain is what happens to this tail. We don't know what happens to this tail. And we don't know how long it's gonna last. And we don't know what is the efficiency of getting the natural gas out of the system. The reason we don't know is because we don't really understand the science and engineering completely of what goes on in these rocks. Let me show you a picture of what this rock looks like. This is what a, a shale rock looks like. These are pores, these are inorganic material covered with some organic, long chain hydrocarbon organic material and adsorbed on this layer of this organic material is the natural gas. It follows what are called Langmuir isotherms. It's a single layer, monolayer, that is adsor adsorbed on it. But if you look at the size, the pore sizes are 10 to 100 nanometers. And the size of these pores depends on the pressure. And the size also controls the flow rate because the mean free path of this natural gas molecules are on the order of 10 to 100 nanometers. So you either, you either in Knudsen flow or in viscous flow or in some transition between them. And we don't quite understand all that, which is why it's very hard to predict. So the mechanics, the solid mechanics and the fluid mechanics are coupled. And we don't know what the coupling and most of the models that are used for shale gas extraction simulation models don't have the coupling today. That's where we are. So there's a lot of opportunity in, tr in trying to even do a better job in what we're doing today. But the impact of natural gas has been substantial. And that mostly has been in electricity generation. Because natural gas feedstock is pretty cheap. And the engines that are used to convert the natural gas stored energy into electricity are natural gas combined cycle turbines, and they're about 60% efficient. So the cost of production of electricity is about four to five cents or six cents a kilowatt hour. This is the cheapest way to produce electricity, and I put a red bar out there because everything else has to compete with that. So where is solar? Where is wind? Well, it turns out this is where we are. Solar today is about 10 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour, and it's going down, and I'll show you some data of that. Wind is actually cheaper than coal, new coal today. And so wind installations are going, uh, you know, gangbusters across the country. And this is, you know, nuclear shade. This is the, the general economics of electricity production in the country today. There's a big difference, though. These are all centralized power plants whereas these are distributed and modular, and I'll come back to that later on. What has happened to the wind industry today? How much wind deployment actually have we seen? This is the cost reduction in cents per kilowatt hour of wind from 1980s to where we are today. It's basically come down drastically, and it's kind of leveling off, and you look at the installed wind capacity, is exponentially increasing. The same thing is happening in solar at a slightly smaller scale right now, but it's also going through that rise. This is the cost of PV modules, photovoltaic modules, and you find that it's going down. And in 2008, 2009, we had never predicted that it's gonna be, the panels are gonna be less than a dollar per watt. It's 65 cents a watt of solar panel. But that's just the panel, and you can see this is exponentially increasing. Now, what is the full cost of solar? The first cost is the panel cost plus all what is called the balance of system. Today, at the utility scale, it's around here, and the residential scale, it's around there. So as you can see, most of the cost is not in the panel. It's in the balance of system. And this is the installation, permitting, all those other things, power electronics, et cetera. And so you ask the question, is there room to reduce this cost? Absolutely. And the, the technological knobs to do that is to increase the efficiency of the solar panel so you install less. 
And most of the efficiency of the solar panels, the thin film solar panels, about 14 or 15 percent, whereas the limit is about 32 percent. So there's a big amount of headroom out there. And so this is going to, we are likely to see this scale exponentially. The question one may ask is that, okay, that's great. What's going to happen to the grid? Is the grid ready for that? So let me show you what's going on in the grid side. Grid is called, the electricity grid is called the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century, which is true, because other, without that, we will not have the information revolution that we are seeing today. This is the fundamental infrastructure to enable that. But the grid that we know it is based on a paradigm that goes back to Tesla and Edison. And what is the paradigm? It's the paradigm, the architecture of the grid, and the paradigm goes back to centralized generation of electricity by big power plants, long distance transmission at high voltage because you want to reduce losses, and then go to a location and then go down in voltage and you have a distribution network, 13 kilovolts running down your neighborhood and then 120 volts out of your plug outlet. That's the paradigm. Why centralized generation? It's because it was cheaper. Most of the plants were thermal power plants and thermal power plants become more efficient as you become bigger, and the economies of scale involved in that. But that paradigm is being questioned now, because when you make a solar panel, if you make it smaller, big, the efficiency doesn't change with size. And it, the ball game changes then. And by the way, in today's grid, depending on how you count it, the, the roughly, approximately, the losses that we encounter because of outages in the United States is about $100 billion. That's a lot. And the ones due to weather-related ones are about 30, 20 or $30 billion, and that is going up. If you look at the data, the weather-related ones keep going up. In addition to that, there is another challenge that we are facing, and this is very serious, and that is due to cybersecurity, cyber-physical security. Let me give you one example that happened close to our home. And this happened um, on a substation called the Metcalf substation, just south of San Jose, north of Morgan Hill. This is Highway 101, and this is a substation on the west of 101. So it turns out that at 2 a.m. on April 16th of last year, less than a year ago, some gunmen took powerful rifles and shot at about I think 10 of the 14 large transformers. These were, they figured out which were the active transformers, possibly by infrared, and shot at the radiators of these transformers to leak out 50,000 gallons of cooling oil, so these would trip. This was going on at 2 a.m. at night. 15 minutes before that, they cut the cables, the fiber optical telephone cables, so that 911 was disabled. And no one in the Bay Area actually heard about it. And he asked, why not? This is a big deal. Because it happened less than 24 hours, in fact, the same night of the Boston Marathon bombing. When the whole media was focused out there, this is what was going on in the Bay Area. And the media never covered it. Till a few weeks ago, Wall Street Journal ran a big article on it. That's the world that we are going to live in. And we don't, we do, I don't even want to see a trend in this. And we do not know who actually did it till today. That's where we are. Talking about the grid, I talked about the 100-year-old architecture. The architecture is 100 years old, but the, some of the devices have changed. So how, what are the average age of some of the key devices? assets on our grid. We have about a trillion dollars of assets on our grid. The age, this transformer that I showed, the average age of these transformers, the expected lifespan is 40 years of these transformers. Big long-term assets. Do you know what the average age of these transformers are? 42 years. So we are minus two on an average in this country. So that's the infrastructure that we have. And this is another problem and this, since we are in California, let me show you what's going on in California. So this is the load curve that the California independent system operator has to match. 
So this is the load curve. This is midnight, noon, 4 p.m., 6 p.m., midnight again. And so it comes down. This is all of California. And it goes up around noon, sort of out here, and then goes up and then goes down again. OK, and this is because we go home and turn on the lights, we start cooking, et cetera. So this load curve is very important because the generation within California has to match this. So what's going on with this load curve? This is what is going on. There's a dip that is happening between noon and 4 p.m. And this dip is going even more, and this ramp up is getting steeper. This is what is called the duck's belly. This is the belly, and this is the face out here, the eyes out here, imagine the eyes over there. This is the duck's belly, and the duck is getting fatter. And this ramp up is now turning out to be, in the future, it's gonna be about 150, 200 megawatts a minute. Amazing ramp up. So why, why, it's, why is this duck getting fatter? Why is the load going down? The load is going down in the middle of the day between noon and 4 p.m. is because of rooftop solar. Because this is getting deployed, this is essentially a negative load. And during this time when there's a negative load, the California ISO has excess electricity. They don't know what to do with it. And so they're trying to introduce negative pricing. That means they'll pay you to take electricity, so there's money to be made. That's the problem. It's the stability of the grid that is a problem. And because the rooftop solar, and many of these ISOs and the utilities don't know where the rooftop solar is, because they're not part of the system. So that is a huge problem that California is likely to face. So here is the paradigm changing that is going on in the grid. Because solar is getting cheaper, in fact, if you look at the tier structure of pricing that I pay, at some point, a rooftop solar is cheaper than what I'll buy from the utility. And so here is the current paradigm. There's wholesale market of electricity, which the utility buys electricity from the wholesale market and delivers it to your home. This market out here, which is where wind generation, this dispatch of various electricity, I won't go into the detail, that the market structure is what is called the day ahead market. That means most of the load, the electricity that we see today was predicted yesterday, 90% of it. And then there's a, if the load and the supply doesn't match up, we have a hour head market, a 15 minute market. Think of it as a big knob and then a fine tuning knob in your instrumentation. That's how we run our grid today. And in terms of, that's on the wholesale side. On the retail side is even worse. This is the tier structure that I encounter in PG&E territory. So this is a retail price, dollars per kilowatt hour. If I'm in tier one, I'm paying 13 cents, and if tier two is 15 cents, I go from tier two to tier three, it's 32 cents. It's more than doubles. And I have no transparency when that happens. And if I try to explain this to my mother, she'll never understand this. Please don't tell my mother I said that. So this is where we are. This pricing structure and this pricing, there's no correlation. And that's what's going on. And here's where the shifting paradigm is happening. The shifting paradigm is gonna happen when you have two-way flow, not just of demand and supply, but of inform and through information. So this is what is going on. If I wanna put a rooftop solar, I, would, I can do that. No one can stop me. If I want electric vehicles, or if I, if I get storage in my garage, no one can stop me. And I get natural gas in my home, and I can take a generator, or perhaps some of the thermoelectric generators that are being developed in Santa Barbara, and I can generate electricity and get the waste heat into my water heater. Think of your information in your home. I used to have a, a single landline. Now I've got landline, I've got cable, I've got cell phone coverage, and I get satellite for my TV. And I have options. If something goes wrong, I could use the other. I do not have that for electricity today. Well, in the future, if these get cheaper, which are getting cheaper, I can do that. But then that requires information to flow. There's a lot of discussion. What is the utility business model going to be in the future? We don't know. But there's clearly a move towards using information flow so you don't get this tiered pricing structure which seems so 20th century, but actually have dynamic prices so that you have just like a stock market. 
And if the demand goes high, the prices go high, and then someone reduces, you can actually save money, you can make money, if you can aggregate the right way. This is where things are going. And this will be assisted by some technologies, not just information technology, but if you really wanted to do arbitrage, for example, you can have storage. Storage is the game changer. Because then you don't need day ahead or hour ahead market, you can just use storage. You don't have to dispatch in real time. You can take wind, put it in storage, and then use it when you need to. But storage is expensive. So in RPE, we focused on that quite a bit. So you have grid scale storage. I put these scales out here, capital cost and levelized cost of storage. And the cost is everything. Cost and scale in energy business is everything. If some technology doesn't scale in cost and volume, it doesn't matter. So what is the best way? What's the cheapest way to store electricity today, which is the bar for all other technologies, is pumped hydro. You pump water up a dam, the capital cost is about $100 a kilowatt hour, and you get levelized cost, additional cost to the levelized cost of electricity, about two to two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. That's where we are. That's the competition. So we created a bunch of you know, uh, programs on storage for the grid scale to bring all the other technologies down to that level so they would be competitive without subsidies. And what are those technologies? With compressed air, different kinds of flow batteries, even superconducting magnetic st energy storage, all various other technologies. We were technology agnostic. If you can store electricity at large scale, at least demonstrate that this could be scaled up at $100, potentially $100 a kilowatt hour in the future, well, you're in the game. And out of that research are now, they were mostly at universities and now being spun out in various startups. This is a good news story. This is from City College in New York, urban electric power, zinc magnetic oxide batteries. From Arizona State University, zinc rechargeable zinc air battery, which is fluidic energy. Now they're taking these boxes that they've created, they're piloting overseas, right now to see how they, how they function. MIT came up with a completely new architecture of lithium ion. This is using the best of the chemistry of lithium ion, but putting it in a flow battery architecture so the system level cost would go down. And they spun off 24M. And this is something in the Bay Area, Primus Power zinc-based battery. So this is what is going on, and they're all gonna compete with each other. And they're, they're in the early stages of piloting these technologies right now. We don't know which one's gonna win. And in fact, many of them will actually fail. But if one of them can scale and get down to $100 a kilowatt hour, it's a game changer, not just in the United States, but more so for the rest of the world. Power electronics, and this is something that we focused on quite a bit. And, uh, and in fact, with a lot of uh, you know, research going on in UC Santa Barbara. Why is this so important? I talked about the aging infrastructure. Well, that's certainly one of the reasons. In this case, you, had, you have to look at various aspects of what you need to do to go f up in voltage, down in voltage, AC to DC, DC to AC, all of that is important. You need switches. And silicon switches are great, but wide band gap semiconductor, silicon carbide, zinc, uh, or gallium nitride, zinc oxide, and a diamond, if you can dope it properly, all those are great materials. You have to make switches that can switch fast. And wider the band gap, the better off you are. Magnetics. You need magnetic passive devices. And if you increase the frequency of switching, your, your, for the same impedance, your inductor size can go down in your filters. And that's very important because the cost goes down. The same thing at capacitors. If your frequency goes up, the capacitor size goes down. And you can possibly, in some application, go from electrolytic capacitors to solid state, and that's really important because reliability goes up. And then, of course, different type of circuit topologies. But the key one out here, if you cannot get the switches right and the magnetics right, you have a problem. So this is, I'll give you a few examples. The same picture that I showed you, this is a substation transformer, 8,000 pounds, use 60 hertz, goes down in voltage, and the, as I said, it is, is aging. On the other hand, you could possibly, in the future, do this. This is a silicon carbide, IGBT, that can handle 15 kilovolts of voltage drop across 200 microns thick layer of silicon carbide. This has to be really good material and can run 100 amps. 
and modulate not at 60 hertz, but 50 kilohertz. And now this becomes the heart of a circuit that can take AC to AC, go down and go up in voltage, and, and make, hopefully in the future, solid state transformer, because if they could do that, this could be potentially 100 pounds as opposed to 8,000 pounds. And that's the technology that we said that we should give this a shot. This is on the switch side. On the magnetics, as they go up in frequency, soft magnets, you know, the losses go up. And the federal government had never invested in soft magnets, all invested in hard magnets for data storage. So we said this could be quite interesting. And there's a lot of engineering of the materials that have to go in to make it low loss, but for both the eddy currents as well as the domain walls moving. So this is the kind of things that we're likely to see in the future, and it's actually a very good news story. Let me spend a little bit on transportation. This is the fuel consumption in transportation in the United States. You've got light duty vehicles, you've got trucks, you've got buses, you've got air, water rail, et cetera. If you look at transportation today, the overwhelming way of transportation is gasoline or diesel and internal combustion engine. Now, if you were to reduce your dependence on oil, well, you, could, you can have different kind of powertrains, different kind of fuels, or different kinds of powertrains. I'm gonna pick one, or actually two of them, and go with it. If you look at electrification, which is a trend, and why is it a trend like the others? Here's what we are seeing. The cost of battery is coming down. It used to be, in 2008, about $1,000 a kilowatt hour for battery, and the battery cost basically dictates the cost of electric vehicles. And that is coming down at a rate that was unpredictable to, in 2008, 2009. And right now it's at about $400 a kilowatt hour and going down even more because the innovation in the materials that are happening. Most of the cost in the battery is in the materials, not in the packaging of the actual cells, not in the manufacturing. And those materials are getting better and you can see this exponential rise again. Again, it's very small compared to the whole vehicle fleet. It takes about 20 years to turn over a fleet. So this is a 20, 30 year trend, and it's very hard to say what's gonna happen in the future, but we're seeing some trend lines. And the battery is key. So what's going on in the battery? This is the lead acid battery in terms of energy density, nickel metal hydride battery, this is lithium ion battery. The cost of these batteries, as I said, was right now it's about $400 a kilowatt hour. It used to be about $500 about a year ago. So this is $500 a kilowatt hour, and ARPA-E, we created a program to go well beyond that, and we, because we realized there are some opportunities in materials innovation that could happen. So we put a target out here, $400 a kilowatt hour or higher at $250 a kilowatt hour. These numbers were not just out of the sky. There was some, a lot of research done to see which way things are going, what are the electrode materials? What's a cathode material innovation that's happening? What are the electrolytes? How much voltage can you go up? Because higher the voltage of the battery, the more the energy density. And we said that this is a stretch goal. And out of this are all these different other kinds of batteries, lithium air, lithium sulfur, advanced lithium ions. And many of them are where at universities now spun out in companies, but they are not just innovating in the company. They are working with national labs, with universities, and this is the feedback loop that is happening between small companies as well as the universities and, and national labs to really innovate. And there's some amazing stories in what's happening in this area. And I think in the next five to 10 years, this cost of batteries are gonna come down. Let me show you one example. This is from Argonne National, this is a company called Envia that licensed the technology from Argonne National Lab using lithium manganese cathodes. And this energy density goes up, the stability is increased, but we still don't understand the phase stability of these materials. And if you could solve that, the, um, it's, the energy density is phenomenal. And this, when combined with the silicon anode, which is where the game is today, there's a huge competition in the battery field trying to figure out how to make silicon anodes work. And no one has solved this yet. But that's where research is going. But they demonstrated a couple of years ago, 400 watt hours per kilogram, and 80% depth of charge, roughly $250 a kilowatt hour in a lab setting. And now they're trying to innovate to see where they can get into the production level. Let me do a quick uh, round on, on biofuels, because people seem to have ignored biofuels. In the long run, it's important to have this. Today, it's expensive. 
Let me tell you, tell you how biofuels are made. You got sunlight and you end up with fuels. And in between, you got all these organisms, either algae or cellulose or cellulosic biofuels or sugarcane or corn. They all depend on photosynthesis. And in photosynthesis, there's something called the Calvin-Benson cycle, which takes energy from photons and takes carbon dioxide and fixes and makes carbon-carbon bonds. And that's how we get all these materials, and we have figured out how to take these and make oil or other hydrocarbon fuels out of them. Now, it turns out these are expensive. And why is that? If you really look into deeply into it, you'll find that is primarily because the efficiency of photosynthesis from sunlight to fuel is less than 1%. And that's because some of the enzymes that are there in the Calvin-Benson cycle are very easily corruptible. They're not very efficient. And because of that, you need a lot of land to capture the sunlight, you need a lot of water, and you've got to collect all of that and concentrate it into hydrocarbon fuels. And that part is very expensive, the feedstock part. Well, how else can we do this? Well, there are lots of investment that has already happened from various you know, private organizations as well as the government. The other way to do it is what JCAP, a joint center for artificial photosynthesis is trying to do. I know that Santa Barbara, I believe, is involved in that with Caltech and LBL and Stanford, et cetera. And that is understanding photosynthesis in, in all its depth and trying to replicate it in inorganic or organometallic materials, non-biological. So this is non-photosynthetic non chemical catalysis or photocatalysis and trying to make advanced fuels through that. We looked at that in RPE and said that there may be another way which is non-photosynthetic, because photosynthesis is inefficient, non-photosynthesis, no, synthetic, but still catalysis, and that is biological catalysis. And we coined the term electrofuels. Let me tell you how it works. In electrofuels, you broaden the concept of photosynthesis. You say, instead of photons, which excites electrons, I can have any reducing equivalents. I can have hydrogen sulfide, I can have ammonia or hydrogen, or iron at an oxidation level, because that's what a lot of extremophiles down in the ocean vents use. They take iron from oxygen plus two to plus three and grab that energy and use that to make carbon-carbon bonds. And so these are non-photosynthetic organisms. You take all these assembly, uh, reducing equivalents, and if you could assimilate that into these kinds of organisms, then you can pick and choose your pathway. So Calvin Benson, happens to be only one way to make carbon-carbon bonds. In biology, there are other ways to do that. Reverse Krebs cycle, woods lungdahl cycle, all these cycles, and we said you could design your own chemical pathway if you want to. And it turns out that these other cycles are more efficient than, than Calvin Benzel, but no one had ever used them. So we said, let's give this, give this a shot. And if you could do that, engineer the, the pathway, you can get to some molecules that are called acetyl-CoA. And if you can get to those molecules, then you can either get to bioproducts, which is more profitable, or get to fuels. So this was the challenge we set up. And we thought this is really hard because these non-photosynthetic organism, while the genome had been discovered, people didn't know how to manipulate the genome. And you got to manipulate them. And we said, let's just give it a shot. If it works, that's great. Otherwise, at least it's, you know, we learned something. To our surprise, and we funded about 15 teams, to our surprise, about five of them started making oil. And this is the first biofuel without the use of sunlight. These are organisms that actually live on electrodes, eat electrons, and produce oil. In this particular case, it eats hydrogen and hydrogen comes from natural gas. So this is a gas to liquid play that, that was created out here. And this is a partnership with OPX in North Carolina. And, and what I saw last was they're making flasks of these. Obviously we don't know whether this is gonna scale or not, but at least it's a proof of concept and it's worth a shot. I'm gonna end with this one out here, which is kind of amusing. We created another program called PETRO. These are nice acronyms that we used to come up over beer um, in RPE. So the problem with biofuels, the corn-based biofuels, is that the energy density, as I said, is really low. It's 80 gigajoules per hectare per year, 
I mean, that's a funky in a units, but just remember that. Whereas sugarcane from Brazil, which is profitable in terms of biofuels, that's about 200. So it's more than double of that. So we said, if he can figure out a way for plants not to make cellulose, but to make long-chain hydrocarbon fuels directly, why can't we go for that? So instead of going through the cellulosic way, breaking down cellulose, why can't we just engineer the plants to make oil? And so at that energy density and potentially that cost in the future. So I'm gonna show you one example of this, which is kind of amusing. We all know that algae can make long, long chain hydrocarbons, but algae has a problem. It needs water and it gets infected and the cost goes up. So this team in Lawrence Berkeley Lab said, why can't we take the metabolic pathway of algae that actually makes the oil, which is the most important part that we're interested in, and engineer that, that pathway, into a plant like tobacco that go, grows in bad soil, and we seem to know a lot about tobacco genome for some reason. And we said that this, let's give it a shot because the idea would be then the, the leaves of tobacco would then get oil, and you can just squeeze it, the oil would come out. It's an amazing idea. And I said, we gotta fund this because you know, it may work, it may not. But if it works, you'll have big oil and big tobacco come and save the world. <laughs> you cannot get better than that. People thought this is impossible. This actually is starting to work, which is absolutely amazing. And I'm trying to keep up with what's going on with all these projects. So I'm gonna end, when people say this is never gonna work, don't even try, you know, think again. If it does not violate the laws of science, laws of physics, you give it a shot, because if it is worth giving. So I'm gonna end the talk with some, my attempt at humor. There's the infamous predictions from the past. And this is from a scientist of much repute, Lord Kelvin, who says radio has no future. X-rays will prove to be a hoax and heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Lord Kelvin was opinionated, but he was wrong. And so this is another, and he was not the only one, he managed to convince Wilbur Wright who in 1901 says, man will not fly, fly for 50 years. I'm glad he didn't take himself too seriously, or Wilbur Wright may have had more influence than Lord Kelvin, on Orville, on, or Orville Wright had more influence. But this is the kind of predictions which are dogma as opposed to data. Let me end my talk with I, what I think is a fabulous quote by Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's the role of scientists and engineers, is to create some magic while follows, following the laws of science. Let me thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a very exciting lecture, and I'm sure this has uh, stimulated some thought and people uh, would like to ask questions. I think Arun is available to uh, answer a few questions. There is a microphone in the front here, so if you'd like to ask a question, please come up to the front. And I see one person already. Go ahead. Uh, phenomenal overview. Uh, thank you so much. As someone who works in technology, I'm tremendously impressed. Less than a week ago, uh, Steve Austin hosted a workshop 600 feet from here on the future of uh, fracking technology, oil and gas in California. And there was a panel that included the editor of Science Magazine, the science director of uh, EDF, the public spokesman of Western States Petroleum. And someone put out there that if the United States has a current climate change or environmental policy, none of the panelists knew what it was. Uh, you've just come from uh, assisting Secretary Chu, a Nobel laureate. Um, I don't think we have a choice between dealing with the environment or dealing with energy independence. We have to do both. Uh, if we do have an, uh, an environmental policy for climate change, could you articulate uh, what it is? I thought that was gonna be an easy question, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> I look at it this way, and I like, let me try to keep it simple, although it's not a simple topic. 
There are three legs to this stool. And in terms of policy, it is really the role of the government that is often asked. What is the role of the government? And that's a much debated issue. But let me tell you what I think. And I think of it very simply, three legs of this stool. Number one is that the government has to invest in R&D because industry is not going to do it. Let me tell you why. For any energy, new energy technologies to scale and make impact in terms of business impact, it takes anywhere from five to 20 years from research ideas to impact, if it's successful. Most businesses in the United States have a horizon of five to seven years. So you got 13 to 15 years gap out there, and someone has to pick up the tab, otherwise new technologies will never happen. That's where the role of the government in the early phases of this research. So that's one, I think everyone agrees that research, even that is disputed sometimes. Okay, that's number one. Number two is to level the playing field in terms of markets. So let me tell you why. I mean, a lot of people talk about carbon tax or carbon price, right? It's unlikely to happen in the near future, but if you are to live in a carbon-constrained world in the future, I think someone has to do that. When you take the full cost, societal cost of something, you've got to include that. What does it do? And in fact, there's a, you know, I interact a little bit with former Secretary of State George Schultz. And what he's been proposing is a revenue-neutral carbon tax. What does that mean? That you, let's say you take $40 a ton, and you collect, the government collects that money and gives it back. Do not put that in the treasury so that it gets lost. Give it back to the people. So it's not an idea of government making money, but it levels the playing field and gives the long-term signal to the industry to turn their course. And it levels the playing field. The third one is the finance, and it has to do with tax policy. Let me explain. If you look at oil and gas companies around, you know, around the country, many of them, like Kinder Morgan, is a pipeline company. It is what is called a master limited partnership. How many of you have, out here have heard what a master limited partnership is? Great, that's great. Most people don't know about this. What is a master limited partnership? It is a way to aggregate public capital from the stock market. It aggregates capital, invests in pipeline. The revenues that come back comes to this MLP and goes back to the investors, and the investors then pay capital gains tax. I'm sorry I'm getting into the tax discussion, but it's important. So why is it good? Because it turns out by law, these MLPs do not pay tax. It's not a corporation, so it's a pass-through. So the tax burden goes down from two, twice taxed, corporate tax and capital gains tax, to one. That's a big deal. Because then the cost of capital for the investment goes down. And in things like solar and all, cost of capital is the majority of the cost. So why am I saying this? Is because today, MLPs are only allowed by law on oil, gas, and coal, and not allowed for solar, wind, and other infrastructure. That's the law today. And there's something called, and we were pushing this from the DOE, to level the playing field, and Senator Coons and a few other, it's a bipartisan pr proposal now, it's on the table to create what is called the MLP Parity Act. So that means create parity, create the tax policy so that you have lower cost of capital, you can aggregate public capital, and today's MLPs have $350 billion of public capital into this market. So that's the kind of thing that the government can do. Three-legged stool, invest in R&D, create a level playing field for the market, and revise the tax policy so that it's a level playing field, you get access to public capital into the industry. There are other details, I can go into that. Regulatory policies like appliance standards for efficiency standard, very important. Cafe standards, absolutely important. There are all these other details on the regulatory side. But put that under the carbon side, on the regulatory side, for level the playing field, as well as finance and R&D. Does that answer your question? It's a long answer. I could go on and on, but I'm gonna stop here.
Hopefully that's a, a somewhat easier question. I wonder if you could comment on the uh, relationship between battery technology and fuel cell technology over the next estimated, say, decade or so, particularly given California's goal of, I think it's 15 percent uh, uh, batteries. Yeah, yeah. Well, storage. Bat or not, not storage. just batteries, but yeah, storage. Yeah. yeah, I mean, frankly, this is, um, if you look at some of the advanced batteries like lithium air battery, they are like fuel cells. So it's an electrochemical system, and you know, it, it, sometimes it's very hard to differentiate. So it all really depends on the round trip efficiency of storing, you can use electricity to produce hydrogen, you can take the hydrogen and put that in a fuel cell and generate electricity. What is the round trip efficiency? What's the cost per kilowatt hour? I mean, that's really will dictate. And I think what we are seeing, the fuel cell costs are coming down because fr frankly, the, the catalyst costs are coming down. There are some new kinds of fuel cell where you don't use platinum or other precious metals as catalysts. So those are coming down. The battery costs are coming down. So it's a competition. We don't know. I, I can't predict whether it's going to be fuel cell or batteries, probably a mixture of both. But it looks like the batteries today at least seem more attractive than fuel cells. But you never know, depending on the application. If you really need high power, you might like to go for a fuel cell than a battery because battery lifetime gets screwed up with high power. And so that's, depending on the application, I think you'll see different. So it's not either or, but it's and. Hello. I know it's very hard to predict the future, uh, but you showed us some very interesting statistics about solar and wind and batteries and storage and all the costs coming down, whereas we know fossil fuels are just getting more expensive and more environmentally damaging to take out of the ground. Um, so I was wondering, you know, I, I believe, I'm, a, I'm a true believer. I have uh, an electric car, I have solar on my house, and I have, you know, power my car as well with, with the solar. I think it's affordable to do right now. Um, but, you know, you've seen a lot of Hail Marys, you know, by, tw say, a date in the future, 2030, how much of our energy is going to be coming, do you think, from renewables versus fossil fuels? How many, uh, per what percentage of the vehicles will be electric cars and hydrogen? Just a guess. Educated guess. Uh, what if I say 30? I don't know. <laughs> I'll pick a number. Um, those are, uh, again, uh, as you said, it's very hard to predict. The only thing we can say is trends. We are seeing a trend. And there is the error bar in the trend is what will grow over time if you start to predict. Okay, I mean, if you look at Wall Street Journal and you can see these, you know, the stock prices and in the future, this error bar will grow. That's, you know, if you, if you take my prediction, it will be wrong. And the only thing we can, as I said, is that it's, we are seeing a trend, exponential growth. Many of these technologies follow this S curve, right? It grows and then it sort of plateaus. And I think we may be seeing this early part of that S curve that is growing and where it will plateau, what slope it will have, and what the adoption rate really depends on all the other things that I talked about. Do we have the market policies or regulatory policies? Uh, do we have the financial? You know, as I said, it's very, if you do not have finance, it's gonna be extremely hard to, uh, to scale. The R&D, frankly, we have the best R&D network in the world out here. And this is one of the places for that. I think the R&D, the scientists and engineers will deliver. They will try. They'll fail most of the time, but I think they can deliver. It is really the scaling and the market, the business side that I'm really concerned about. And that's what gives me the uncertainty. And I, I can't say if it's 30 or 40% electric vehicles. I don't know. And I think it'll be, and I'm not trying to give you a Washington answer and just give you a non-answer. I just don't know what the answer is. Well, I always ask a question regarding electrical machines, the un, uh, uh, I mean, forgotten subject. Uh, everywhere people talk about efficiency, and they talk about everything else but electrical machines. You mean motors, uh, yeah. motors, and, motors generators. and generators? Oh, absolutely critical. I mean, and this uh, is, I yeah. saw you mentioned about the magnetic materials and so on, but. Yeah. This was a big deal for us. Uh, I, I don't see any, anything. No, 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 we actually invested area. quite a bit. So let me give you the context of this. Electric machines, a large fraction of our electricity in this country goes to machines 
like motors and generators, et cetera. And if you don't make them efficient, we're going to lose a lot of energy. There's a bigger problem than that. Most of these electric machines use magnets, permanent magnets. The permanent magnet that is used today is, or mostly is what are called iron boride, neodymium-based iron boride magnets with a sprinkle of dysprosium to make it stable at higher temperatures, to, to have its energy density at higher temperatures. These rare earths, nadumium, neodymium, and dysprosium, and various other materials, they're called critical materials, because 95% of them come from China. And China has its internal demands, and there's a supply chain risk in the United States, actually globally, because of these rare earths. So we actually created a program called REACT, rare earth free magnets. Can you make permanent magnets which have higher energy density than the iron boride based, neodymium based iron boride magnets? And frankly, there are. There are phases. Iron 16 nitrogen 2 is a crystal which is highly anisotropic with better energy density than iron boride magnets. And we invested in that. We said, maybe it's not the magnets, maybe it's the design. Can we have better induction motors, smaller, high energy induction motors to do that? Could we have, you know, you know, uh, switch reluctance motors to do that. So this is very important, and I think you're absolutely right, and I think we need to do much more than what we had done in RPE, but we did actually look at that very carefully. Yep. So you haven't talked about Google much. Um, can you just talk about what you do with Google now and how past initiatives you've, you've done with RPE, what impact you can have now that you're doing this at Google? So Google, yeah, I didn't talk about Google because, um, well, let me just explain. Google is a 100% carbon neutral company. And how do we achieve that? Number one, we use a lot of electricity. We try to use it as efficiently as possible, number one. Number two, we invest a lot in terms of project finance in renewable energy, renewable electricity. We have invested about $1.4 billion so far. This is not charity, this is for revenues. But this is also to promote clean energy. We work with utilities to introduce new tariff structure to promote, to get more integration of renewables in the electricity grid so that we use more le renewable electricity. And frankly, what we cannot, we just buy offsets, carbon offsets. We pay for it to be carbon neutral. Electricity is a very important aspect of what we do. Without electricity, there is no Google. And so we look at that in our internally, in our, all our hardware, we pay a lot of attention of how to manage the electricity to enable computing. And now we are trying to see how we can take computing and enable electricity in the right way. And that's what is a very exciting part, to see how we can get computing to enable electricity in the right way to enable the 1.5 billion people who do not have access to electricity and another 1.5 billion people who have very marginal access, 3 billion people, to get access to electricity, because without that, leave alone you know, inform access to Google or access to information, there's access to education, access to many other things. So our goal is to look, look at the user and see how we can get them access to electricity so they get access to information and much more. And that's what we really focus on on the long term. A uh, question about the, the picture you showed of the, the California load, and particularly about the duck belly. Yeah. So are we seeing this duck belly occur now? And, and what's the prediction in terms of when that's really going to become a, a belly, given the, the solar uh, production in California? Um, I don't know the numbers as to how deep it's going to go. But when I spoke to the Cal ISO, they're really concerned about it. And frankly, in Southern California, it's even more concerning because we used to have a nuclear plant in San Onofre, right, right north of San Diego. That is stopped now. We're not going to use that. So Southern California near San Diego this summer may have a problem. And that's what I heard from the Cal ISO folks. I don't know exactly how deep it's going to go, it's, but it's worth checking. Um, you know, I, I yeah, can I, look into that, I can ask, but you can ask Cal ISO as well uh -huh. as to what, how deep that duck's belly is going to be. So it's, uh, we're already reaching th the level of installed solar that's significant enough to really offset. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're thinking of negative pricing right now. I mean, I wish 
like ChargePoint, which is a charging, EV charging company, could aggregate all its load, deal with the utilities, and store that electricity during the middle of the day when you have excess electricity and actually get paid for it. That's a business proposition, right? That's a kind of, I think, innovative solutions that we got to find out, but I'm not sure the utility laws will allow you to do that aggregation. Thank you. I actually had a question uh, related to this. The energy storage, which you really need if, if you want to optimally utilize the, the renewables, do you envision energy storage being done in a distributed way or a more centralized facility uh, of, of a large scale? I think distributed way will, will happen because of people. It's likely to happen. I mean, I want to, if I buy a new home, and if I get a cheaper electricity from a solar panel, and someone finances it, like Solar City, where I have no upfront cost, why wouldn't I do that? Right? And I think now Solar City is going to get its batteries from Tesla, right? And, and, and they're going to have storage in your home. So this will, will likely happen. I think on a, on a Cal ISO, on a state level, the state is pushing for, you know, aggregated or centralized storage facilities. They're not, they're not calling it store, aggregated or centralized, but it might happen in that, that respect. So I think you're gonna have a combination of distributed and centralized. And the question really becomes, how do you make that whole system work? And I think information is going to play a role. Because right now, if you look at this market structure, the reason it's very difficult to dispatch wind and solar, et cetera, actually solar is much more predictable than wind. We know when the sun rises and when it sets, kind of, right? And we put the solar panels in the Palm Springs in the middle of the desert that most places don't get clouds most of the time. So it's very predictable, actually fairly predictable. Wind is less. So, but if you, the reason it is very hard to integrate on the grid is because the grid, the Cal ISO is trying to maintain the frequency at 60 hertz plus minus 0.05. Okay? And frequency is a proxy for load supply imbalance. And I think this is the, if you, if you try to get that higher tolerance, then, and you don't let it go, drift too far apart, you have a real problem. And so I think what is likely to happen, because you have day-head market, et cetera, it's very difficult to integrate solar and wind. If you have day-head market, if 90% of your market is day-head, that may change. And I think if you can get to more of the power into the five-minute market, 15-minute market, or, or even shorter time scale, you may have better integration of wind and solar. So the market structure and technology have an interplay. And I think that, in addition to storage, that can solve the problem also if you have information going back and forth. Um, this question regards uh, storage, but I can see it applying to a few other uh, areas as well. Um, the, I was wondering about like degradation, basically. Um, so, for instance, if you're trying to do large scale storage, whereas the Hoover Dam works basically as well as it did, you know, 50 years ago, a battery may not have that sort of long term advantage of it. And I guess the question is, are the, do you think the solutions to these problems are? materials problems or more like mechanical, that sort of thing? Um. All of the above. Because these are systems. You will have electrochemical problems in the electrodes. The electrodes, I mean, if you look at a lithium ion battery, if it charge at too high a rate, you lose lithium because of all the side reactions that happen. So we got to understand all this chemistry and figure out ways to stop the side reactions so you don't lose lithium in a layer of material that you don't want. I mean, so these are all undesirable. So there's a materials aspect to it. How you package them, very important. It turns out in lithium ion, they like to swell. <laughs> They're gas evolution. Pressure them, they may be better off. Uh, how you package has a huge impact on the cost. Um, how you do the control system of the battery. If you were to distribute the current or the power evenly, or if some battery is going downhill, you direct the power somewhere else, but you need to know that it's going downhill. And so sensors in the batteries 
and then feedback systems to be able to control where it goes and optimize the system, extremely important. So these are, you know, I may, be, may have spoken about the materials issue, but these are at the end of the day systems issues. So mechanical, all of it, electrical, electrochemical, all of them are important. Um, what role do you think or should nuclear play g going forward? Well, this is my personal opinion. I don't think we can address climate change globally without nuclear in the mix. It's, I think it's going to be very hard. I'm not saying it's impossible, because you do need baseload power, and you do need baseload clean electricity. And I think we have to look at nuclear as a strategic way in the United States, but frankly, globally. The problem with nuclear, I think Fukushima pushed us back about a decade in terms of nuclear. I hope it's only a decade um, in the United States. Germany decided to get away from it. I don't know how to explain that. Um, in the United States, we basically said, and this is when we were in the DOE, we basically said that we're going to not take our eye off the ball of nuclear, but we will make sure that our current 104 nuclear plants are as safe as it's possible and make our regulatory work even more stringent so that we can make them safer. And that's the position we took. And right now, nuclear is not so much, I mean, there's a regulatory side to which takes time, but it's really important. But it's really a financial risk problem. And I can go into, which is why we're going to small modular reactors. But um, I won't bore you with the details, but that's where the nuclear industry is going. Instead of making a two gigawatt nuclear plant, you're probably going to see in the future, 10 years from now, you know, 100 to 300 megawatt modular reactors that will be placed. And financing that is much easier than trying to put a two gigawatt plant. Uh, I find it interesting that so much of this duck, duck's belly uh, has been put at the foot of grid-connected solar when there's so much public policy, especially in California, that contribute to it and are something we should all be congratulating ourselves over. I mean, Title 24, cool roofs, uh, uh, materials for roadways and that buildings might be made from that would reduce the urban heat island effect, uh, space cooling systems that actually perform, district cooling, all of which the government has supported mm -hmm. is finally gaining traction. It should continue essentially forever. If somebody has a variable speed pool pump that reduces their reliance on grid electricity, 3,000 kilowatt hours uh, a year, that's no different than two kilowatts of grid connected solar. Everybody could have predicted this would take place. It's gonna continue forever. Shouldn't government be leading a more thoughtful discussion instead of vilifying grid-connected solar? It's just one thing everyone's going to do more of that's going to mean that the utility business model of selling more and more electricity may not always be the case. And the system has to be engineered to take that into account. I mean, all of these things are things the Department mm -hmm. of Energy the state of California, kind of very gradually implemented thoughtful public policy has contributed to. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure the government is vilifying, you know, distributed rooftop solar. I think there is a, let me put it this way. I think a lot of people are trying to understand where the utility business model will go in the future. And I don't think it is, uh, the jury, uh, the jury is still out. I don't think the answer is there. Because a lot of, I'm, I'm not saying every utility, but many utilities seeing the distributed model as a threat. And frankly, it doesn't need to be. Um, if the economics at some point will trump, I don't know where the question, who asked the question? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'm not sure. I think it's, I would rather see the electricity sector embrace these distributed models and actually finance it, frankly. There's money to be made. Because many of the utilities have AAA bond rating, so they can get lower cost of capital than Solar City. So they can actually make money. Um, so I think embracing that and coming up with new business models so that they are embraced it 
I would say the 21st century reality. It's going to get cheaper. We're seeing the trends. So more and more of this happens. So I think you're, you're right. I, I would love to see more progressive thinking in some of the policies, the state policies, frankly, um, not so much the federal policies. The federal policies are wholesale electricity market, FERCs, and et cetera. But the state policy in the Utility Commission, it'll be great to see that. And, and frankly, the Utility Commission is aware of it. And the utilities are aware. It's just that we have to figure out how to, how to engage in the right way and get, come up with the right policies. You know, most of the municipalities, you know, they've cut these uh, long-term deals with uh, cable companies that now provide high-speed internet. You know, even though we're in this mobile world, we can still go ahead and look at our email on our mobile devices, but if I want to work in my office or my home office, I have to log on the internet. And that's, I only have one provider here in Santa Barbara Cox. And my question is, what's Google's initiative in terms of energy to bring these prices down? I know they're rolling out certain test markets in the Midwest, uh, sort of a high-speed network in terms of, if, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure if it's uh, Google fiber optics, but what will the consumer have in terms of choices, not only with the municipalities' deals with like Cox Cable or Charter, but what's Google's mandate to bring those prices down lower, give the consumers competitive prices, high-speed internet, and secondly, can you talk about the Google barge that's moved from San Francisco to <laughs> um, Stockton? I wish I knew what the barge was about. I, I could tell you, yeah, I wish I could tell you more. But in the Google Fiber thing, I mean, look, the Google Fiber, the offering that you get, I think it's like $70 um, for really high speed. I mean, you get almost 10 times the speed for the same price, something like that. I mean, don't quote me on that. Um, I mean, that's a great deal. Now, we are not obviously there in every locality. We are working with the cities right now. And, and frankly, wherever we're working, it's creating competition and so that the competitors are lowering their prices. So it's a good thing. So I wish you get Google Fiber in the future. <laughs> but I think even if you don't, the price will be lower. Competition is good, and I think that's what it's creating. You started by outlining uh, these major societal challenges. Uh, and do you think the level of uh, federal government funding for energy-related research has been commensurate with those challenges? Thank you for asking that question, Mr. Senator. Uh, <laughs> no, it should be way more. It should be way, way more. Let, let, me give you an, let me give you some numbers. And people ask me that should your budget be higher? You know, RP had a budget of $300 million. And I said, should your budget be higher? And we were told that we could never ask for more than what the president asked which is true, it's a president's budget, it's not my budget. But the, I used to give a comparison, I said, I'm not asking for more money, but let me give you some numbers. When DARPA was started, do you know what its budget was? In the first year, first year of appropriation budget, and I'm, I don't want to bore you with terms used in Washington, but appropriated money is the money given to you by Congress on an annual basis. The first appropriated budget of DARPA which was called ARPA at that time, was $246 million in 1962 dollars. Now you do the math, and you'll come up with about one to $1.5 billion. And if you think that this is an important problem, if you're really serious about it, that's the budget it ought to be. And I never asked for more money, but I used to just give this number, it's your choice. You think about it, how seriously you, you, we should invest in it. The only thing I t used to tell people, that don't take the budget from $300 million to a billion dollars in one jump. That's really bad. Because we will not know how to spend that money in the right way. It's, after all, taxpayer dollars. Just give me a ramp. And give me a ramp so that I know where it's going to be the, in, the research community knows that it's going on a ramp, and they take it seriously because we want to get the best, attract the best minds to energy research. And if you could do that, we will, the engineers and scientists will deliver. <laughs>